This day is the end of our slavery, the fount of our liberty, the beginning of joy. Now the people, liberated, run before their king with bright faces. Hello, and welcome to another episode of ADHD History, the history of the world in no particular order. I'm your host, Xander Millette, here to provide you with another riveting tale. Today, our journey takes us to the turbulent reign of a monarch whose name alone conjures images of splendor, scandal, and sweeping change. He was the second Tudor King of England, a man whose insatiable quest for an heir would forever alter the course of the nation. The indomitable Henry VIII. In this episode, we will delve deep into the life, loves, and complex reign of this larger-than-life figure, exploring the man behind the myth and the lasting impact of his rule on the British Isles and beyond. So, tighten your doublet, fasten your farthingale, and join us as we uncover the secrets of Henry VIII, a king who defied convention and left an indelible mark on history. In the turbulent landscape of the Renaissance, Henry VIII emerges as a standout figure, commanding attention and reshaping the course of English history. His reign ushered in a transformative era marked by political upheavals, religious schisms, and cultural shifts. Against the backdrop of a Europe undergoing profound changes, he is a compelling focal point for understanding the dynamic interplay of power, religion, and personal ambition during this period. His legacy, fraught with complexities and contradictions, invites exploration into the intricate tapestry of the Renaissance, where a single monarch could wield such influence as to alter the destiny of a nation. Born at Greenwich on the 28th of June, 1491, Henry VIII was the third child and second son of Henry VII and Elizabeth of York. He was baptized by Richard Fox, the Bishop of Exeter, at a church of the observant Franciscans. In 1493, at the age of two, Henry was appointed the Constable of Dover Castle and Lord Warden of the Cinque Ports. He was subsequently appointed Earl Marshal of England and Lord Lieutenant of Ireland at age three, and was made a Knight of the Bath soon after. The day after that ceremony was completed, he was created Duke of York, and a month or so later made Warden of the Scottish Marshes. In May 1495, he was appointed to the Order of the Garter. The reason for giving such lofty appointments to a small child was to help his father retain personal control of lucrative positions and not share them with established families. Henry VII was well known for his frugality. After all, his position as king was still tenuous. He had unseated the established Plantagenet dynasty with a very fragile claim to the throne. His father had been a descendant of Owen Tudor and Queen Catherine, the widow of Henry V. His mother, Margaret Beaufort, was a descendant of the half-siblings of Henry IV. Nevertheless, Henry VII was the senior male claimant to the House of Lancaster and had won the crown at the Battle of Bosworth Field after Richard III was killed. But that's a story for another episode. 17th century biographer Lord Herbert of Sherbury, who had access to sources unfortunately now lost to us, claimed that Henry VII had intended for young Henry to enter the church. By the time he became king, Henry VIII was fluent in English, French, Latin, and had a very good understanding of Italian. His teachers would say, as a writer and speaker, he showed eloquence, quote, worthy of a great orator rather than a king. Arthur was the eldest Tudor child, born in 1486, followed by Margaret in 1489, then Henry in 1491, and finally Mary in 1496. Henry VII and Elizabeth had three other children who did not survive infancy. Mary became the Queen of France, the third wife of Louis XII in 1514. Mary's granddaughter was the Lady Jane Grey, famously known as the Nine Day Queen. Margaret would go on to be Queen of Scotland after marrying James IV in 1503, and her granddaughter would become the infamous Mary, Queen of Scots. Yay! Henry VII began discussions for betrothing his eldest son and heir, Arthur, 
with King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella of Spain's fourth daughter, Catherine, in 1489. It took 13 years to arrange the marriage. Unless a bride was being reared at her future husband's court, geographical barriers often prevented a royal couple from meeting, and royal courtship would consist of formal letters and symbolic gifts. Catherine had to rely on descriptions of her future husband and country from ambassadors and court painters. A dowry of 200,000 ducats was agreed on, with half to be paid up front and half after the marriage. In 1501, Catherine arrived in England and married Arthur roughly a month later. Henry seemed to be half in love with his sister-in-law just from the descriptions he read in letters sent to him from friends and acquaintances. Henry had the honor of leading Catherine down the aisle at her wedding, and was said to make more of an impression on the crowds than his older brother did. Catherine's physician, Dr. Alcaraz, writing about Arthur said that he had, quote, never seen a man whose legs and other bits of his body were so thin, end quote. Arthur and Catherine then traveled to Ludlow Castle, where Arthur was meant to begin studying his responsibilities as Prince of Wales. But in 1502, Arthur died at the age of 15 of possible sweating sickness, just five months after the marriage. Dr. Alcaraz would later claim that, quote, the prince had been denied the strength necessary to know a woman, end quote, though other sources claim differently. Edward Hall's Chronicle stated that Arthur emerged from his bedchamber the morning after the wedding and demanded ale for, quote, I have been this night in the midst of Spain, end quote. We will never know the truth, though Catherine swore to the end of her days that her marriage to Arthur was never consummated. Arthur's death thrust all of his duties upon his younger brother. Marriage negotiations between Henry and Margaret of Angoulême, a kinswoman to the King of France, were put on hold as it was now not a lofty enough union for the heir to the throne. Henry VII renewed his efforts to seal a marital alliance between England and Spain, by offering his son Henry in marriage to the widowed Catherine. One of his most pressing concerns was to avoid refunding the half of Catherine's dowry he had already received and gaining the other half. I want my money, man! Catherine's mother, Queen Isabella, was keen on the idea. Another treaty was signed for their marriage, and they were betrothed two days later. A papal dispensation was only needed for, quote, the impediment of public honesty, end quote if the marriage had not been consummated as Catherine and her duenna claimed. But Henry VII and the Spanish ambassador set out instead to get a dispensation for affinity, which took into account the possibility of consummation. Cohabitation was not possible because Henry was too young, so Catherine took up residence at Durham House in London. In 1503, Henry VIII's mother, Elizabeth of York, died in childbirth. Her death had a significant impact, not only on her son, but her husband as well. Weakened by grief from losing his eldest son and his wife in less than a year, Henry VII fell ill with tonsillitis, which affected his breathing and left him unable to swallow or even open his mouth. Other claimants to the throne began plotting, as Henry VIII was only 11 years old and still too young to be an effective ruler. Henry VII eventually recovered his health, but he became even more withdrawn and seemed unwilling to take an active role in raising his surviving son. In 1504, Henry VIII became the new Prince of Wales, Duke of Cornwall, and Earl of Chester. He had not immediately been granted these titles after his brother's death in the case of the possibility that Catherine of Aragorn had conceived, as a son of hers would have taken precedence over Henry's claim to the throne. At the age of 13, Henry VIII and his retinue were absorbed into Henry VII's household, and the king's paranoia grew. Henry VIII's rooms could only be accessed by walking through the king's rooms, and his son was not allowed to go anywhere without a large retinue of guards. Isabella's death, also in 1504, and the ensuing problems of succession in Castile complicated the issue of a marriage contract for Henry VIII. Catherine's father, Ferdinand, preferred Catherine to stay in England, but Henry VII's relations with Ferdinand had deteriorated. Catherine was therefore left in limbo for some time, complicated further by Prince Henry's rejection of her as soon as he was able, just before his 14th birthday in 1505. 
He asserted that the betrothal had taken place during his minority, when he had not been able to object, but that he could now judge better for himself. Ferdinand's solution was to make his daughter ambassador to England, allowing her to stay in England indefinitely. Devout, she began to believe that it was God's will that she marry the prince despite his disagreement. Henry VII died on the 21st of April, 1509, and the 17-year-old Henry succeeded him as king. Henry VIII commissioned a grand tomb for his parents, inscribed with praise of them both and many emblems of the Tudor dynasty. In accordance with tradition, Henry did not attend his father's funeral, instead remaining in the Tower of London. Catherine, too, did not attend, as the funerals of kings were considered no place for any woman. Soon after his father's burial on the 10th of May, Henry suddenly declared that he would indeed marry Catherine, leaving unresolved several issues concerning the papal dispensation and the missing part of the marriage dowry. The new king swore that it had been his father's dying wish that he marry Catherine. Whether or not this was true, it was convenient. Emperor Maximilian I had been attempting to marry his granddaughter Eleanor, Catherine's niece, to Henry. She had now been jilted. Henry came to Catherine's apartments at Greenwich, dismissed her attendants, declared his love for her, and asked her to be his wife. In one swoop, all of Catherine's fears were dismissed, and she thanked God for answering her prayers. Henry's wedding to Catherine was private and held at the Friars Church in Greenwich on the 11th of June, 1509. On the 23rd of June, Henry led the now 23-year-old Catherine from the Tower of London to Westminster Abbey for their coronation, which took place the following day. It was a grand affair. The King's Passage was lined with tapestries and laid with fine cloth. Following the ceremony, there was a grand banquet in Westminster Hall. As Catherine wrote to her father, quote, our time is spent in continuous festival, end quote. The festivities were brought to an end by the death of Henry's grandmother, Margaret Beaufort, who died on the 29th of June, the day after Henry achieved his majority and could legally rule his kingdom. Two days after his coronation, Henry arrested his father's two most unpopular ministers, Richard Empson and Edmund Dudley. The complaints against them would not have held up in court, so the charges laid against them were that, during the late king's final illness, they ordered their friends to take up arms in preparation for his death. Compassing the king's death was high treason, and they were executed in 1510. Politically motivated executions would remain one of Henry's primary tactics with dealing for those who stood in his way. By contrast, Henry's view of the House of York, potential rival claimants for the throne, was more moderate than his father's had been. Several who had been imprisoned by his father were pardoned, including Thomas Gray, the second Marquess of Dorset. Others went unreconciled. Edmund de la Pole was eventually beheaded in 1513 an execution prompted by his brother Richard plotting against King Henry. Henry was also not forgiving of those deemed heretics. In 1511, six men and four women were denounced for claiming that the sacrament was only bread and not the body of Christ. They were forced to recant and made to wear a badge of a faggot in flames for the rest of their lives. Two of the men were burned at the stake as it was their second time accused of heresy. They would not be the last to be burned during Henry's reign. An Italian cleric wrote, I do not wonder that the price of faggots has gone up, for many heretics furnish a daily holocaust, and yet more spring up to take their place. Catherine lived up to her motto, humble and loyal. She oversaw the management of the royal household, engaged in charitable works, and sewed Henry's shirts. She shared Henry's love of hunting, watching tournaments, and court entertainments. He wrote poems and songs for her. For example, quote, As the holly groweth green and never changeth hue, so I am, ere hath been, unto my lady true. End quote. Henry had come to the throne an archetypical spare heir, carefree, outgoing, and pleasure-seeking. Catherine indulged his desires and could see no wrong in him. Soon after marrying Henry, Catherine conceived. She gave birth to a stillborn girl on the 31st of January, 1510. 
About four months later, Catherine became pregnant again, and on the 1st of January 1511, a son, who they named Henry, was born. After the grief of losing their first child, Henry and Catherine were pleased to have a boy, and festivities were held, including a two-day joust known as the Westminster Tournament. Unfortunately, the baby boy died seven weeks later. Catherine had two more stillborn sons in 1513 and 1515, but finally gave birth in February 1516 to a girl, Mary. Mary would be Catherine's only child to live past infancy. Relations between Henry and Catherine had been strained, but they eased slightly after Mary's birth. In 1518, she fell pregnant again with another girl, who was again stillborn. Although Henry's marriage to Catherine has since been described as, quote, unusually good, it is known that Henry took mistresses. The most significant mistress for about three years, starting in 1516, was Elizabeth Blount, also known as Bessie. Blount is one of only two completely undisputed mistresses, considered by some to be very few for a virile young king. Exactly how many mistresses Henry had is disputed. David Lodes believes that Henry had mistresses, quote, only to a very limited extent, end quote, while Alison Ware believes that there were numerous other affairs. Catherine is not known to have protested, keeping her feelings about her husband's infidelity to herself. Blount gave birth in June 1519 to Henry's illegitimate son, Henry Fitzroy. At the age of six, the boy was made Earl of Nottingham and then Duke of both Richmond and Somerset in June 1525. Some thought this was a step towards his eventual legitimization. While Catherine had said nothing about her husband's affairs, she was publicly unhappy with the illegitimate boy's elevation. The Venetian ambassador reported that, quote, the queen resents the earldom and dukedom conferred on the king's natural son and remains dissatisfied, end quote. Henry blamed three of Catherine's Spanish ladies-in-waiting for encouraging her and dismissed them from court. Catherine, it was said, was obliged to submit and to have patience. More titles were soon heaped upon Fitzroy. His domestic appointments included heading the Council of the North, Lord Admiral of England, and Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. There were rumors that he might be made King of Ireland. Thomas Wolseley, Henry's chief minister, was charged with taking care of Fitzroy, and Wolseley promoted him as a possible husband for, amongst others, both Catherine de' Medici and the Infanta Maria of Portugal, niece of the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. But in 1533, Fitzroy married Mary Howard, a cousin to Anne Boleyn. It's said that Anne arranged this marriage to remove any chance he had of gaining power on an international stage. You gotta do what you gotta do. It didn't matter, though. He died childless three years later at the age of 17, apparently of tuberculosis. At the time of his death in 1536, Parliament was considering the Second Secession Act, which could have allowed him to become king. Ah, nut. Henry VIII's feelings about his son's death are unknown but arrangements for his funeral are odd enough to suggest emotional confusion and a desire not to publicly acknowledge the death. On the 3rd of August, 1536, Eustace Chapwis recorded that Fitzroy, quote, after being dead eight days, has been secretly carried in a wagon, covered with straw, without any company except two persons clothed in green, who followed at a distance into Norfolk, end quote. The king's son was buried, with very little ceremony, in Thetford Priory, and attended by very few people. It was a quiet end for a man who many thought might one day be king. But back to 1513. Henry VIII ordered built two new dockyards on the Thames to strengthen England's resilience against foreign threats, in particular from France and Spain. Woolwich and Deptford were identified as ideal locations because they were situated in London, where it was easy to get arms, supplies for building ships, and a ready labor force. They were also close to the King's Palace at Greenwich. The foundation stone of the Deptford Dockyard was rediscovered in 2014 at the University of London, where it had been moved during the bombings of World War II. The stone, roughly eight feet high and emblazoned with the initials H and K for Henry and Catherine, can now be observed at its original site. 
He also organized England's navy as a permanent force and founded the Council for Marine Causes, which would later become the Admiralty. Also in 1513, in June, Henry appointed Catherine Regent of England while he went to France on a military campaign. When Louis de Orleans, Duke of Longeville, was captured at Thoreau, Henry sent him to stay in Catherine's household. She wrote to Wolseley that she and her council would prefer the Duke to stay in the Tower of London, as the Scots were, quote, so busy as they now be, end quote. And she added her prayers for God to send us good luck against the Scots, as the king hath there. The war with Scotland occupied her subjects, and she was, quote, horrible busy with making standards, banners, and badges, end quote, at Richmond Palace. Catherine wrote to towns including Gloucester, asking them to send muster lists of men available to serve as soldiers. The Scots invaded, and on the 3rd of September, 1513, she ordered Thomas Lovell to raise an army in the Midland countries. Catherine rode north in full armor to address the troops, despite being heavily pregnant at the time. She sent a letter to Henry along with a piece of the bloodied coat of King James IV of Scotland, who died in the battle, for Henry to use as a banner at the Siege of Tournai. Catherine's religious dedication increased as she became older, as did her interest in academics. She continued to broaden her knowledge and provide training for her daughter, Mary. Education among women became fashionable, partly because of Catherine's influence, and she donated large sums of money to several colleges. Henry, however, still considered a male heir essential. The Tudor dynasty was new, and its legitimacy might still be tested. A long civil war had been fought the last time a woman, the Empress Matilda, had inherited the throne. The disasters of civil war were still fresh in living memory from the Wars of the Roses. In 1518, Henry VIII founded the Royal College of the Physicians of London, the RCP. It's now the oldest medical college in England, celebrating its 500th anniversary in 2018. Many physicians of the time were working with no formal training and killed as many patients as they cured. What started out as a pleasant afternoon of drugs and surgery has not gone as planned. Scholar Thomas Lenacre persuaded the king to establish the RCP with the power to grant licenses and punish unqualified practitioners of medicine. A degree was usually required to gain a license, and candidates were required to pass an examination demonstrating they were classically educated in a range of subjects. The Royal College of Physicians has had a library collection since its foundation in 1518, although most of the original books were destroyed during the Great Fire of London in 1666. Currently, it boasts approximately 130 books printed before 1502, including some of the earliest printings of the classical medical texts by Greek, Roman, and Arabic doctors as well as several books belonging to and annotated by the Elizabethan astrologer and occultist John Dee. An act of parliament in 1523 extended the RCP's power from London to the entirety of England. So basically, Henry is the reason why England has doctors at all. <laughs> in 1520, Catherine's nephew, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, paid a state visit to England and she urged Henry to enter an alliance with Charles rather than France. Immediately after his departure, she accompanied Henry to France on the celebrated visit to Francis I, the field of the cloth of gold. It's a scam. It's all a scam. A peace treaty was signed between the two monarchs. The field of the cloth of gold cost an estimated modern day 19 million and was a colossal waste of money. More gold is required. Within two years, war was declared against France, and the Spanish emperor was once again welcome in England, where plans were afoot to betroth him to Catherine's daughter Mary. In 1525, Henry VIII became enamored of Anne Boleyn, a lady-in-waiting to Queen Catherine. It is unknown how much younger she was than Henry, being born between 1501 and 1507. Anne was the daughter of Thomas Boleyn and his wife Elizabeth Howard, the eldest daughter of Thomas Howard, then Earl of Surrey and future second Duke of Norfolk. Anne's date of birth is unknown, and it's also uncertain when her two siblings were born, 
but it seems clear that her sister Mary was older than Anne, and their brother George was possibly born around 1504. The only information we have to guess what their ages were was Thomas Boleyn writing in the 1530s, where he stated that his children were born before the death of his father, William Boleyn, in 1505. Anne's early education was typical for women of her class. In 1513, she was invited to join the schoolroom of Margaret of Austria, daughter of Maximilian I, Holy Roman Emperor, who ruled the Netherlands on her nephew Charles's behalf. Anne's academic education was limited to arithmetic, her family genealogy, grammar, history, reading, spelling, and writing. She also developed domestic skills, such as dancing, embroidery, good manners, household management, music, needlework, and singing. Anne learned to play games, such as cards, chess, and dice. She was also taught archery, falconry, horseback riding, and hunting. She stayed in the Netherlands until her father arranged for her to be a lady-in-waiting to Henry VIII's sister Mary, who was about to marry Louis XII of France in October 1514. In France, Anne was a lady-in-waiting to Queen Mary and then to Mary's 15-year-old stepdaughter, Claude. Anne's education in France proved itself in later years, inspiring many new trends among the ladies and courtiers of England. She was then recalled to England to marry her Irish cousin, James Butler, a man several years older than her, living at the English court. The marriage was intended to settle a dispute over the title and estates of the earldom of Ormond. The plan failed, probably because Sir Thomas hoped for a grander marriage for his daughter, or because he himself coveted the titles being disputed. Whatever the reason, the marriage negotiations came to a complete halt. Mary Boleyn, Anne's older sister, had been recalled from France in late 1519, presumably to end her affairs with the French king and his courtiers. This is a rumor I personally don't think is true, or at the very least, I hope not. When she returned to England, she was married to William Carey, a minor noble, and was reportedly between the ages of 12 and 14. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Child marriage is gross. I know it was common for the time, but I don't care. It is gross. <laughs> After her marriage, Mary became the king's mistress. Historians dispute Henry VIII's paternity of one or both of Mary Boleyn's children born during this marriage, Catherine and Henry Carey. Henry himself did not acknowledge either child as he did his illegitimate son, Henry Fitzroy. Historian Alison Ware speculates that only Catherine was the offspring of Henry VIII, but both she and Henry were acknowledged as cousins by Elizabeth I and held high positions in her court. Henry began to believe that his marriage to Catherine was cursed and sought confirmation from the Bible, which he interpreted to say that if a man marries his brother's wife, the couple will be childless. Even if her marriage to Arthur had not been consummated, and Catherine would insist to her dying day that she had come to Henry's bed a virgin, Henry's interpretation of that biblical passage meant that their marriage had been wrong in the eyes of God. But that's how it works! Leave me alone! Whether the Pope at the time of Henry and Catherine's marriage had the right to overrule Henry's claimed scriptural impediment would become a hot topic in Henry's campaign to wrest an annulment from the current Pope. Catherine was defiant when it was suggested that she quietly retire to a nunnery, saying, God never called me to a nunnery. I am the king's true and legitimate wife. Henry set his hopes upon an appeal to the Holy See, acting independently of Cardinal Thomas Wolseley. William Knight, the king's secretary, was sent to Pope Clement VII for an annulment, on the grounds that the dispensing bull of Pope Julius II was obtained by false pretenses. Henry also petitioned, in the event of his becoming free, a dispensation to contract a new marriage with any woman, even in the first degree of affinity, whether the affinity was contracted by lawful or unlawful connection. This clearly referred to Anne, since Henry had been intimate with her sister Mary. As the Pope was, at that time, the prisoner of Catherine's nephew, Emperor Charles V, following the sack of Rome in May 1527, Knight had difficulty in obtaining access to him. In the end, Henry's envoy had to return without accomplishing much. Henry now put this great matter into the hands of Wolseley, who did all he could to secure a decision in Henry's favor. Both the Pope and Martin Luther 
raised the possibility that Henry have two wives, not with the intent to legitimize polygamy, but to, quote, preserve the royal dignity of Catherine and Mary, end quote. I'm sure no one told Catherine of the suggestion. <laughs> I doubt very much that she would have gone for it. I will look for you. I will find you. And I will kill you. Wolseley convened an ecclesiastical court in England with a representative of the Pope presiding, and Henry and Catherine herself in attendance. The Pope had no intention of allowing the decision to be reached in England, and his legate was recalled. How far the Pope was influenced by Charles V is difficult to say, but it is clear that Henry saw that the Pope was unlikely to annul his marriage to the Emperor's aunt. The Pope forbade Henry to marry again before a decision was given in Rome. Wolseley had failed and was dismissed from public office in 1529. Wolseley then began a secret plot to have Anne Boleyn forced into exile and began communicating with the Pope to that end. Do you think that was wise? When this was discovered, Henry ordered Wolseley's arrest and had he not been terminally ill and died in 1530, he might have been executed for treason. Dude literally died to avoid dying. <laughs> what an eccentric performance. Thomas Cranmer, a friend of the Boleyn family, was appointed to replace him. A year later, Henry finally banished Catherine from court, and her old rooms were given to Anne Boleyn. Catherine wrote in a letter to her nephew, Emperor Charles V, in 1531, bemoaning the stress that she was under, writing that it was enough to shorten 10 people's lives. That poor lady. In 1532, Thomas Cromwell brought before Parliament several acts, including the supplication against the ordinaries and the submission of the clergy, which recognized royal supremacy over the church, thus finalizing the break with Rome. Following these acts, Thomas More resigned as chancellor, leaving Cromwell as Henry's chief minister. The House of Commons forbade all appeals to Rome and enacted the penalties of premunire against all who introduced papal bulls into England. It was only then that Pope Clement, at last, took the step of announcing a provisional excommunication of Henry and Cranmer. He condemned the marriage to Anne, and in March 1534 declared the marriage to Catherine legal and again ordered Henry to return to her. How many times do we have to teach you this lesson, old man? Henry now required his subjects to swear an oath attached to the First Succession Act, which effectively rejected papal authority in legal matters and recognized Anne Boleyn as queen. Those who refused, such as Sir Thomas More, who had resigned as Lord Chancellor, and John Fisher, Bishop of Rochester, were placed in the Tower of London. In late 1534, Parliament declared Henry, quote, the only supreme head on earth of the Church of England, end quote. The church in England was now under Henry's control, not Rome's. Even before her marriage, Anne Boleyn was able to grant petitions, receive diplomats, and give patronage, and had an influence over Henry to plead the cause of foreign diplomats. During this period, Anne played an important role in England's international position by solidifying an alliance with France. On the 1st of September, 1532, Henry granted her the title of Marquisette of Pembroke, an appropriate peerage for a future queen. Anne and Henry attended a meeting with the French king at Calais in winter 1532, at which Henry had hoped to enlist the support of Francis I of France for his attended marriage. The conference at Calais was something of a political triumph. But even though the French government gave implicit support for Henry's remarriage, and Francis I had a private conference with Anne, the French king maintained alliances with the Pope that he could not explicitly defy. Soon after returning to Dover, Henry and Anne had their secret marriage ceremony. A second wedding took place in London on the 25th of January, 1533. Catherine was formally stripped of her title as queen. On the 23rd of May, 1533, Thomas Cranmer declared Henry's marriage to Catherine unlawful in a specially convened court, even though Catherine had testified that she and Arthur had never been intimate. Five days later, on the 28th of May, Cranmer ruled that Henry and Anne's marriage was valid. Anne was then crowned Queen Consort on the 1st of June, 1533, 
in a magnificent ceremony at Westminster Abbey with a banquet afterward. Unlike any other queen consort, Anne was crowned with St. Edward's crown, which had previously only been used to crown monarchs. Until the end of her life, Catherine would refer to herself as Henry's only lawful wedded wife and England's only rightful queen, and her servants continued to address her as such. Henry refused her the right to any title but Dowager Princess of Wales, in recognition of her position as his brother's widow. Catherine was moved from place to place, each a little worse than the last. She was then finally transferred to Kimbolton Castle in Cambridgeshire, where she confined herself to one room. She only left to attend mass and she fasted continuously. While she was permitted to receive occasional visitors, she was forbidden to see her daughter Mary. They were also forbidden to communicate in writing, but sympathizers discreetly conveyed letters between the two. Henry offered both mother and daughter better quarters and permission to see each other if they would only acknowledge Anne Boleyn as the new queen. Both refused. In late December 1535, sensing her death was near, Catherine made her will and wrote to her nephew, Emperor Charles V, asking him to protect her daughter. She died at Kimbolton Castle on the 7th of January, 1536. Catherine was buried in Peterborough Cathedral with the ceremony due to her position as Dowager Princess of Wales and not a queen. Henry did not attend the funeral and forbade Mary to attend. After her coronation, Anne settled at Greenwich Palace to prepare for the birth of her baby. The child born on the 7th of September, 1533 was a girl who was named Elizabeth. The birth of a girl was a heavy blow to her parents, who had confidently expected a boy. All but one of the royal physicians and astrologers had predicted a son, and the French king had been asked to stand as his godfather. Now, the prepared letters announcing the birth of a prince were hastily edited to read princess instead, and the traditional jousting tournament for the birth of an heir was cancelled. Anne feared that Catherine of Aragorn's daughter, Mary, who was stripped of her title as princess and labeled a bastard, posed a threat to Elizabeth's position. Henry soothed his wife's fears by sending the baby to Hatfield House, where Elizabeth would live with her own sizable staff of servants, as well as the fact that the country air was thought better for the baby's health. Anne frequently visited her daughter at Hatfield and other residences. After Catherine of Aragorn's death, Anne attempted to make peace with Mary. Mary rebuffed Anne's overtures, perhaps because of rumors circulating that Catherine had been poisoned by Anne or Henry. These began after the discovery during her embalming that Catherine's heart was blackened. Modern medical experts agree that this was not the result of poisoning, but of heart cancer, an extremely rare condition that was not understood at the time. Most likely, though, Mary hated Anne for taking her mother's place and considered Anne a usurper, replacing her mother, the rightful queen. The king and his new queen experienced periods of calm and affection, enjoying a reasonably happy relationship. Anne's sharp intelligence, political acumen, and forthright manner, desirable traits in a mistress, were considered unacceptable in a wife during that era. There were reports of her using harsh language, even to her uncle. After a stillbirth around Christmas 1534, Henry briefly contemplated divorcing Anne without returning to Catherine. However, the matter was dropped and the royal couple reconciled, spending the summer of 1535 on a progress. By October, Anne was pregnant once again. Anne was aware of the dangers if she failed to give birth to a son. With Catherine dead, Henry would be free to marry without any taint of illegality. At this time, Henry began paying at court to one of Anne's ladies-in-waiting, Jane Seymour, and allegedly gave her a locket containing a portrait miniature of himself. While wearing this locket in the presence of Anne, Jane began opening and closing it. Anne responded by ripping the locket off of Jane's neck with such force that she made her fingers bleed. Totally reasonable reaction. <laughs> Later that month, the king was unhorsed in a tournament and knocked unconscious for several hours, a worrying incident that Anne believed led to her miscarriage five days later. Another possible cause of the miscarriage 
was an incident in which Anne saw Jane Seymour sitting on Henry's lap and flew into a blind rage. Whatever the cause, in a bizarre twist of fate, the same day that Catherine of Aragorn was buried at Peterborough Abbey, Anne miscarried a baby which seemed to be male. Chapois commented, quote, she has miscarried of her savior, end quote. In Chapois' opinion, this loss was the beginning of the end of the royal marriage. While Anne recovered from her miscarriage, Henry declared that he had been seduced into the marriage through deception. His new favorite Jane Seymour was quickly moved into the royal quarters at Greenwich. Anne's biographer Eric Ives believes that her fall and execution were primarily engineered by her former ally Thomas Cromwell. Anne argued with Cromwell over the redistribution of church revenues and foreign policy. She advocated those revenues should be distributed to charitable and educational institutions, and she also favored a French alliance. Cromwell preferred an imperial alliance and insisted on filling the king's depleted coffers. For these reasons, I've suggests, quote, Anne Boleyn had become a major threat to Thomas Cromwell. In late April, Mark Smeaton, a musician in Anne's service, was arrested. Initially denying any involvement with the queen, he later confessed, possibly after torture or being tempted with promises of freedom. On May Day, Sir Henry Norris, another courtier, was arrested, though being of normal birth, he could not be subjected to torture. Before his arrest, Norris received kind treatment from the king, who even offered him his own horse for the May Day festivities. It appears that during these celebrations, the king was informed of Smeaton's confession, prompting the subsequent arrests of the alleged conspirators on his orders. Despite Norris's assertions of innocence and of Queen Anne's blamelessness, he was detained, along with Sir Francis Weston and Sir William Burretton. The final individual implicated was Anne's own brother, George Boleyn, arrested on charges of incest and treason. On the 2nd of May, 1536, Anne was arrested and taken to the Tower of London by barge. Four of the accused men were tried in Westminster on the 12th of May, 1536. Weston, Breton, and Norris steadfastly maintained their innocence, while Smeaton pleaded guilty. Three days later, Anne and George Boleyn faced separate trials in the Tower of London. Anne was accused of adultery, incest, and high treason, considering the implications for the throne's succession if the charges were true. The penalty for a guilty verdict was hanging, drawing, and quartering for a man, and burning alive for a woman. The other charge of treason against her was that she was plotting the king's death with her lovers so that she might later marry Henry Norris. The jury unanimously found Anne guilty. The accused men were condemned to death, and George Boleyn and the others were executed on the 17th of May, 1536. Henry modified Anne's sentence from burning to beheading, bringing in a skilled swordsman from France for the execution choosing a method deemed more fitting for a queen than the common axe. On the morning of the 19th of May, Anne was taken to a scaffold erected on the north side of the White Tower. Anne climbed the scaffold and made a short speech to the crowd. It is thought that Anne avoided criticizing Henry in this speech to save Elizabeth and her family from further consequences. But even under such extreme pressure, Anne did not confess guilt, and indeed subtly implied her innocence. After a brief farewell to her weeping ladies and a request for prayers, she knelt down and one of her ladies tied a blindfold over her eyes. She knelt upright in the style of French beheadings, and the execution consisted of a single stroke. She was then buried in an unmarked grave in the chapel of St. Peter ad Vincula. Her skeleton was identified during renovations of the chapel in 1876, during the reign of Queen Victoria. Anne's grave is now identified on the marble floor. Following the coronation of her daughter Elizabeth as queen, Anne was venerated as a martyr and heroine of the English Reformation, particularly through the works of John Fox, who argued that Anne had saved England from the evils of Roman Catholicism and that God had provided proof of her innocence and virtue by making sure her daughter Elizabeth I ascended the throne. During the trials and Anne's subsequent execution, 
Henry banqueted on his barge with various courtiers and musicians, often returning after midnight. He was obviously very broken up about the whole thing. The day after Anne's execution, Jane Seymour was brought to York Palace, and ten days later, on the 30th of May, they were married. Jane chose the motto, Bound to Obey and Serve, to show she was absolutely subservient to the will of her husband and king, unlike her predecessors. In 1536, under orders from the king, the official assembly of the English clergy laid down the Ten Articles of Doctrine for the Church of England. The dissolution of the monasteries began, and over the next four years, all 563 religious houses would be closed, their monies taken for the monarchy's coffers. Among the wealth taken was a ruby that King Louis VII of France donated to adorn St. Thomas Becket's tomb in 1179 in Canterbury. Henry had it made into a thumb ring and ordered the saint's body thrown into a dung heap as he considered Becket a traitor to his king. Queen Anne begged Henry to reconsider the dissolution, but he told her to keep silent if she wished to avoid Anne's fate. When Jane announced her pregnancy in 1537, Henry decided to humor her and refounded Bisham Priory as an abbey and also established a convent at Stixwold. They would be closed again within a few years. The peerage greatly benefited from the shutdown of the monasteries, many converting monastic buildings into lavish homes, a great number of which survive today. Henry kept a few for himself and converted several into palaces, the most important of which were situated on the road between London and Dover. Jane gave birth to the long-awaited prince on the 12th of October, 1537, named Edward after the Saint Edward the Confessor. In my personal opinion, it was because there were only four names to choose from in Tudor England for a boy. Edward, Henry, Thomas, or William. <laughs> Jane grew very ill after the birth, and theories vary on what exactly killed her. Some have theorized that she caught puerperal fever, while others think she never passed the placenta and caught an infection. Whatever the reason, Jane died October 24th, just 12 days after the birth of her son. She was the only one of Henry's wives to be given a queen's burial. He apparently planned to commission an effigy of Jane sleeping, surrounded by statues of children holding baskets of flowers, but it was never built. In 1543, when Henry was married to Catherine Parr, Henry had a painting commissioned of himself, his wife, and his three children. But instead of painting Catherine, Jane is the queen seated by his side, wearing a gown from a previous fresco she was portrayed in in Whitehall. Considering her entire relationship with Henry until her death had only been about two years, it goes to show her lasting impact on Henry's mind and heart. His will stipulated that he wanted to be buried beside her with an effigy of himself, but like Jane's effigy, it was never built. Thomas Cromwell began the search for another wife for Henry, but it would be several years before Henry would choose one. Cromwell was also hard at work bringing down the house of Plantagenet, in 1538, Cromwell arrested almost all of the former royal house, imprisoning them in the Tower of London. Pope Paul III was shocked at Henry's treatment of his own kinsmen and ordered the bull of excommunication, drawn by his predecessor five years before, to be put into effect. England's Catholic neighboring kings of France and Spain signed the Treaty of Toledo, agreeing to make no further alliances with England. Regardless of the excommunication, Henry continued with his reformation. Parliament passed the Act of Six Articles, enshrining the doctrines of the Church of England in law. While the new act gave the death penalty to those who didn't observe the sacraments, it also authorized an English Bible to be chained in every parish church. For the first time in history, ordinary people were able to read the scriptures for themselves rather than just trusting the priests reading it out loud. By the summer of 1539, Cromwell was starting to lose his popularity. He'd made many enemies over his career, and Henry didn't like how much Cromwell took the side of religious radicals. Cromwell decided his best chance of getting back on top was to have Henry marry Anne of Cleves. He sent Hans Holbein to Cleves to paint her and her sister for Henry to look over. Cromwell spun tales of Anne's beauty to Henry, entrancing him. She's a 
huge tracts of land. But few people had ever actually seen Anne. On the rare occasion she appeared in public, she was covered in unshapely clothing as her upbringing had been extremely strict and anything frivolous was frowned upon. The Duke of Cleves, Anne's brother, was apparently reluctant to agree to the marriage, bringing up Henry's previous wives as examples that his sister would not be secure or happy. Henry decided that he would marry Anne without a dowry if her picture pleased him, and the Duke of Cleves quickly agreed to allow Anne's portrait to be painted. Holbein's painting of Anne is considered to be one of the most exquisite miniatures ever painted, and can be seen today in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Henry immediately agreed to marry her after seeing it. However, there were a few issues that came up before the marriage. First, Henry was disappointed to learn that Anne spoke zero English, only High Dutch, a language Henry couldn't speak. The second issue was that a possible pre-contract existed, and Anne might not be free to marry Henry after all. After investigations, it was determined that the pre-contract didn't exist, and plans began to bring Anne to England. When she reached Rochester, the king rode off to meet her rather than continue to wait for her to come to him. It's said that he did not announce himself as the king to her at first, instead pretending that the king had sent him to greet her with presents for her arrival. When he did reveal that he was actually Henry, Anne didn't know enough English to greet him, and instead pointed out the window to a bull baiting taking place. Henry's moon turned instantly, and he left, taking his presence with him. Henry turned his ire towards Cromwell, insisting that he had gotten the king into this mess and he would get him out of it. Why must you fail me so often? But Cromwell doubled down, telling Henry that the marriage had to take place. They had no other allies, and if they sent Anne of Cleves home, it would disgrace her so badly no other man would be likely to marry her. Cleves would probably declare war for the offense, and other countries, such as France and Spain, might take the opportunity to declare war themselves. Henry had no choice. He had to marry her. The wedding took place on the 6th of January, 1540. There was no public betting ceremony, and the morning after, Henry seemed to take great pleasure in declaring his impotence. He told Cromwell that he had zero desire for her, that her body disgusted him, and that she stank. Soon, the whole court was laughing at Anne behind her back. Fortunately for her, she still couldn't understand much English and didn't realize she was the butt of many jokes. The oldest of the future Queen Elizabeth's surviving letters was written to Anne of Cleves, greeting Anne as her new stepmother. Touched by the letter, Anne asked Henry if her six-year-old stepdaughter could come to court. He took the letter from her and gave it to Cromwell, instructing him to reply that, quote, she had a mother so different from this woman that she ought not to wish to see her, end quote. I know the scriptures say, judge not lest ye be judged, but you know, I'm just gonna come out and say it. This guy's a real jerk. Anne did not give up, however, and would later become friends with all three of Henry's children. By all accounts, the marriage was never consummated. During a conversation with a few of her ladies-in-waiting, Anne revealed just how little she knew of how sex was supposed to happen. Once informed that if things continued as they did, she would never provide a child for Henry, Anne began to realize her precarious position. Her feelings about this revelation are unknown, but she became very conscious of conducting herself with the utmost decorum. She watched as he began a new conquest, Catherine Howard, one of her ladies-in-waiting. Again? Seriously? He definitely had a type. <laughs> While she personally bore her no ill will, Anne knew of what had happened to her predecessor, Anne Boleyn, and feared what would happen to her if Henry deemed her in the way of his future happiness. Henry never ceased trying to find a way to divorce her. In April, he surprised everyone by creating Cromwell, the Earl of Essex. The king confided to his friend Norfolk that he intended to lure Cromwell into a false sense of security in order to exact a more satisfying revenge. He wanted Cromwell to dissolve the marriage he had forced the king into before he destroyed him. When France and Spain began to make friendly overtures towards England once again, it became clear that a German alliance was no longer necessary. 
In June 1540, Henry sent Anne to Richmond Palace on the pretext that there was plague in London. He said he would join her there shortly, but he never did. It should have been a sign to her that he didn't arrive. Henry was ever fearful of illness and would have traveled as far away as he could if there was a hint of sickness around him. In July, Parliament determined that the king could divorce Anne on three counts. One, she had a possible pre-contract, despite no evidence of it being found. Two, the king did not want to marry her. The third, and most important reason, was that the marriage had never been consummated. Henry sent counselors to inform her that their marriage was not valid. She did not protest, and acquiesced to the divorce gracefully. For doing so, she was granted a yearly stipend worth about $30,000 today, along with Richmond itself and several other properties. Henry also granted her the status of being his honorary sister, making her a woman of means so long as she stayed in England. She informed him that she liked it in England and meant to stay for good. She promised to show Henry any letters she received from abroad and ask his advice about any matters raised in them. Cromwell was arrested with no warning that same month on charges of heresy and presuming too far above his station. Though the charges made no mention of his role in the king's marriage to Anne of Cleves, it was well known that it was the true reason for his fall. Cranmer tried to intercede for mercy on Cromwell's behalf, but Henry was adamant that he die. Though Cromwell was of lower birth, the king commuted his sentence to beheading the manner in which so many of Cromwell's victims had previously passed. He was executed on the 28th of July, 1540. Unfortunately, the executioner missed and did not decapitate him in one stroke. Ah, nuts. Some historians have expressed the opinion that as the king's evil genius, his suffering was no less than he deserved for his greed. On the day Cromwell died, Henry married again, this time to Catherine Howard, cousin of Anne Boleyn. She was between 15 and 17 years old to Henry VIII's 49 years. Now that is just not appropriate. The marriage was kept secret for 10 days as the king was infatuated with her and wanted to be with her in private. He trusted that he had found a wife who embodied all the qualities he most admired in women, beauty, charm, obedience, and, he believed, virtue. Well, if you learned anything today, it won't be the truth. By this point in his life, due to advancing paranoia and attacks of excruciating pain from his long, unhealed leg wound, Henry was prone to unpredictable bouts of rage. When he was in such moods, his counselors would only rarely contradict him. Since his ego was so large, he wasn't able to conceive that he might be in the wrong. I'm invincible! You're a loony. His role as supreme head of the Church of England made him certain that he had a special relationship with God. He would constantly compare his own honesty and chivalry to the deceit of others. Catherine Howard made him feel young and virile still, pretending not to notice his bad leg or the smells coming from it. In return, he lavished her with jewels and rich clothing. She, being young and naive, loved the attention being queen brought her, and made no attempt at queenly duties. Catherine's former secretary from her time spent in the Duchess of Norfolk's household wrote to her and begged for a position from the new queen. Unfortunately for Catherine, she could not refuse. Joan Bulmer had been present for Catherine's previous relationships with two men, Henry Mannix and Francis Deere. She used this information to blackmail Catherine for favors. Catherine was in no way prepared for her new position, having been raised virtually impoverished and devoid of luxury. The sudden power she gained went to her head. There is nothing to suggest that she was arrogant or mean, but she was unable to resist the manipulations of those around her. She managed to intercede on behalf of a prisoner of the tower, Thomas Wyatt, and secure his release. She was not successful with the other prisoner she tried to help. Margaret Pole, the 68-year-old Countess of Salisbury and the descendant of the Plantagenets. On the 28th of May, 1541, Margaret was woken and told she would die that day. The executioner was inexperienced and shut his eyes while he swung his axe, brutally killing her with multiple strokes. This bloody message! Oh, I can't believe it! 
Bates. Henry's reputation suffered. He was now more feared than loved by his subjects. I could have done better, but I chose not to. Catherine's former lover, Francis Derham, came to court and blackmailed her into granting him a position in her household. He was prone to boasting that if the king died, Catherine was sure to marry him. Catherine warned him to watch what he said, but he didn't listen, eventually brawling with another courtier who accused him of disrespect. Cranmer was informed of Catherine's previous relationships by a woman who had also served in the Duchess of Norfolk's household, and he told the king of what he had learned. The king broke down in tears in front of his council, apparently heartbroken that Catherine had deceived him so badly. Henry was said to appear depressed and older than he ever had, no more a young man. Knowing that if she could see Henry face to face, she would likely be forgiven because he was weak to the tears of women. Catherine tried to run past the guards, keeping her confined to her room, but was dragged back, kicking and screaming. Henry left Hampton Court soon after. When Cranmer went to interrogate her, he wrote that she was so frenzied, he feared for her sanity. She promised to answer all questions truthfully and do whatever he asked if it meant the king might grant her mercy. Cranmer didn't manage to get much information out of her as she would grow hysterical every so often, but he concluded that she had probably been pre-contracted to Derham before her marriage to Henry. Catherine mentioned Thomas Culpepper in her confessions, and Cranmer ordered him to be arrested and questioned as well. Many courtiers testified that there had been an illicit relationship between Culpepper and Catherine. Culpepper himself stated that he had never done anything with the queen than exchange words. Whether or not the allegations were true, Culpepper was found guilty of intercourse with the queen, as was Derham. Both were sentenced to be drawn and quartered. Culpepper, being of high birth, was allowed to be beheaded. Derham was not so lucky. Probably should have kept his mouth shut. <laughs> in February 1542, Catherine was taken to the Tower of London. After being informed that she was to die, she asked that the executioner's block be brought to her room so that she could practice. She was beheaded on Tower Green, where her cousin Anne Boleyn had died less than six years before. She was also buried next to her cousin in the chapel of St. Peter ad Vincula. Henry seemed emotionally devastated after Catherine's death, and it wouldn't be until the end of 1542 that he reportedly regained some of his old spark. King James V of Scotland was defeated at the Battle of Solway Moss, and Henry was certain that his nephew would grant him more control over Scottish affairs as a result. But James V took to his bed and died after learning of the defeat, leaving his newborn daughter Mary as Queen of the Scots. Henry was thrilled. He viewed Mary as a prospective bride for his now five-year-old son Edward, hoping to unite England and Scotland with the marriage. In 1543, Henry began to express interest in Catherine Parr, a woman of about 30 who was married to his friend Lord Latimer. He passed in March of that year, and Henry kept his intentions towards her a secret out of respect for her as a widow. Henry was aware that she had been discussing marriage with Sir Thomas Seymour, brother of the late Queen Jane. Catherine only became aware of Henry's feelings towards her when Henry sent Seymour away from court as a permanent ambassador to the Netherlands. Henry now began to pursue her in earnest, and she had no choice but to let him think his advances were welcome. They were married on the 12th of July, 1543. One of the witnesses to the marriage was Anne of Cleves, who expressed her happiness at their union. Once the new queen's household had been organized, Henry took her to Windsor, where he celebrated by having three Protestant heretics burned at the stake. Catherine was watched closely to see how she would react, as she was suspected of having Lutheran sympathies. She did not attempt to intercede, and instead seemed to just want to enjoy her honeymoon. I mean, it's just, it's just such a great wedding gift, I don't know how she didn't appreciate it. <laughs> Catherine's chief interest was in theology and she was seen as a champion by the Protestant reformers as they hoped she could influence the king in matters of religion, despite her lack of intercession at the burnings. She wrote and published three books, and they were marked as the first time a Queen of England had publicly given her personal views to her subjects. 
The August after her marriage, she invited all three of Henry's children to court with his permission. Catherine took it upon herself to supervise the now 10-year-old Elizabeth's education, and so impressed Henry that he tasked her with finding a suitable tutor for Edward. Mary and Catherine, being close in age, became close friends. Catherine became her confidant in everything except religious matters, and Catherine did much for Mary's frustration by treating her with the respect due a princess. Due to Catherine's influence, Henry passed a new act of succession in 1544. He named Edward his heir, followed by Mary and then Elizabeth should Edward not have any heirs of his own. As a sign of his trust in her, Henry named Catherine regent while he departed for an invasion of France. Henry succeeded in capturing the French city of Boulogne in what was to be his last personal military victory and returned home. Henry's moods still fluctuated wildly and was not helped by the random illnesses he now suffered from. In 1546, Catherine was implicated in having received some heretical books from a woman who was convicted and executed for heresy. He allowed her to continue to engage him in religious debate, alert for any signs of heresy. He signed the warrant drawn up for her arrest, and when informed of this, she went to the king to beg for forgiveness. She claimed she had only ever disagreed with him on religious matters to learn, as he was much better equipped to understand such things by dint of his gender. He forgave her, and Catherine made it her chief priority to conform to her husband's wishes from then on. In December 1546, Henry gave his last public speech to the members of Parliament. He dictated his will, made provisions for Catherine as his widow, and expressed his desire to be buried next to his late wife, Jane. The last man to be executed during his reign was the Earl of Surrey, accused of a plot to remove Catherine as queen and replace her with his sister, the Duchess of Richmond. Lord Norfolk, the uncle of both Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard, was also arrested and imprisoned in the tower. He would stay there for six years before being released. Henry became ill in January 1547. He was stricken with a fever and had to have the ulcer on his leg cauterized, a painful process before anesthetics. On the 28th of January 1547, Henry died in his sleep. Modern medical experts believe the cause of his death was likely a pulmonary embolism. For two days, his death was kept secret and meals were still delivered to his quarters. Finally, the Earl of Hertford rode to inform the nine-year-old Prince Edward and Princess Elizabeth of their father's passing and of Edward's ascendancy to the throne. Edward was brought to the Tower of London on January 31st and left it King Edward VI. On the 14th of February, Henry's body began its journey to its final resting place. Two days later, his coffin was laid next to Jane Seymour's in St. George's Chapel. Plans for his tomb were never completed. Edward ordered it to be, but Mary, who inherited the throne after his death in 1553, never worked on it. Elizabeth made plans to have it finished, but the plans fell through. Her minister, William Cecil, commissioned a survey of the work needed to complete the tomb, and new plans were prepared in 1565. Whatever completed items there were in Westminster were moved to Windsor, but after 1572, work came to a standstill. The items remained at Windsor until 1646, when the Commonwealth needed funds and sold the effigy of Henry to be melted down for money. After the execution of King Charles I in 1649, his remains were placed in the same vault in the chapel. It was deemed appropriate to bury him there because it was quieter and less accessible than somewhere else in London to reduce the number of pilgrims to the grave of the martyred king. During the reign of Queen Anne, one of her many infants died and was buried in the same vault. In 1805, the sarcophagus that had been Henry's was taken and used as the base of Lord Nelson's tomb in St. Paul's Cathedral. The grave was then forgotten until it was rediscovered when excavation commenced in 1813 for a passage to a new royal vault. The Prince Regent requested a marble slab be inserted to mark the grave, but this didn't happen until the reign of King William IV in 1837. The inscription on the slab reads, In a vault beneath this marble slab, 
are deposited the remains of Jane Seymour, Queen of King Henry VIII, 1537, King Henry VIII, 1547, King Charles I, 1648, and an infant child of Queen Anne. This memorial was placed here by command of King William IV, 1837. The reign of Henry VIII stands as a pivotal and transformative period in English history. From his accession to the throne in 1509 to his death in 1547, Henry's reign witnessed profound political, religious, and social changes that reverberated for centuries. His quest for a male heir, marked by marriages, divorces, and the break with the Catholic Church, reshaped the religious landscape of England. The dissolution of the monasteries, the establishment of the Church of England, and the centralization of power in the monarchy were emblematic of the seismic shifts during his rule. Beyond the political and religious realms, Henry VIII's cultural patronage and the enduring legacy of his six marriages continue to captivate historical inquiry. The complexities of Henry's character, marked by his charisma, intelligence, and ruthlessness, defy simplistic categorizations. His reign, categorized by both achievements and controversies, remains a subject of fascination and scholarly debate. The impact of Henry VIII on the trajectory of England's history from the Tudor period to subsequent centuries, underscores the enduring significance of his rule. And so ends today's episode. Thank you so much to the books Catherine of Aragorn by Teresa Ehrenfeit, Catherine of Aragorn by Giles Tremlett, The Tudors by G.J. Meyer, Henry VIII by Alison Ware, The Six Wives of Henry VIII by Alison Ware, The Wives of Henry VIII by Antonia Frazier, and Henry VIII by The Men Who Made Him by Tracy Borman, for all of the research help as well as the countless websites I've hit up for information. I hope to have you listen in to my next episode. I'm thinking possibly the French Revolution. You can find me on my Facebook page, ADHD History, and on Twitter, Blue Sky, Threads, and Instagram at It's ADHD History. See you next time. Arrivederci.